And as you get turned to the book of Acts, chapter 20 tonight, um, we have been looking at God's grace in different avenues. We started last week looking at God's gracious calling. And tonight we're going to look at God's grace in sanctification. And that's a big word that we usually do not use in our everyday language, but it's a very important biblical word and a biblical doctrine that we as Christians need to understand in order to fully understand the goodness of God. If the goodness of God stops at God's calling, or if His grace stops at, um, at, at His justification, that isn't quite as amazing as what we sing about when we sing Amazing Grace. But when we sing about God's amazing grace, this is a grace that continues all the way from the moment of that gospel call to the moment we are with the Lord. And we're going to look tonight at the different points about sanctification. We're looking at positional sanctification. We're going to look at progressive sanctification. And we're going to look at complete sanctification. So we start out in the book of Acts chapter 20 verse 32 as we talk about positional sanctification sanctification. In Acts 20 and 32 says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and an inheritance among all of them which are sanctified. As we talk, look at sanctification from this angle, what we're talking about is when a man is saved and born again, God positions him in a different place. His position changes spiritually. Now, you may physically be in the same place you always were, but positionally in the eyes of God, you have moved from being in sin to being in Christ. Now, you may say, well, we missed something. We talked about God's call. We didn't talk about God's justification. Now, the reason I didn't mention salvation or mention being justified by grace is because we talk about that all the time. That's a comment. We tell that they're saved by grace. But once someone is saved by grace, what happens on the spiritual side? The spiritual side is God sanctifies us. Now, it's the same thing that we're talking about, we're talking about the word adoption. Uh, when you look at a, a young child that is an orphan without parents, and, and maybe they're being fostered when a, a person's in a foster situation, the government can come along and take that child away. Their position doesn't change. But when a parent or a set of parents adopts a child, they go in front of the judge and legally that child's position changes. They go from belonging to this parent to belonging to this brand new set of parents. Their position changes. In the family of God, we are adopted at the moment of salvation and our relationship goes from the devil being our daddy to God being our daddy. Because the bottom line is the Bible says that we are uh, serving a master, but we cannot serve two masters. It be it's God or it's the devil. It's one way or the other. And just as the writer is saying in the book of Acts here, that we are commended to God, they are, we are given to God by the word of grace, and we receive an inheritance through and by because God has moved our position. When the day comes and I leave this world, the Lord tarries is coming, and I go by the way of the grave, my stuff is going to go to somebody. My stuff is not going to go to, you know, Tom or Susie down the road. My stuff will go to my kids. Why? Because they are in a position where they are mine to receive my inheritance. If we want to see the inheritance of Jesus Christ, receive the inheritance of God, we've got to get a position change. And the only way that this can happen is by the grace of God. I can't work to move my position. Now, in the world, I can work, I can move up ranks, I can get promotions, I can do this, I can do that. Spiritually speaking, I can offer God nothing to make me desirable to Him. I've got news for you. We're the most undesirable people in the world to God. And you know what? He still seeks and saves us and adopts us. To me, that is absolutely amazing. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2 says, Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Notice what the writer says. He is speaking to the church. In other words, if to be a part of God's church, you've got to be sanctified. You've got to be positionally moved into Christ. But not only that, he says we are called saints the moment that we are positioned in Christ. You have certain religious groups 
that thinks you have to earn sainthood by some sort of work you do after salvation. But the Word says right here, the moment we are saved and born again and positioned in Christ, we become saints of God. If you're here tonight and you're saved, you're a saint. Period. There is no, it doesn't come later on. It doesn't come with a, self, a second helping of grace. It comes at the moment of salvation. Because the moment you are saved, you are as saved as you're ever going to be. The moment my children were born, they were my children as much as they ever were going to be. Now, there's days when it's good. There's days when it's bad. There's days when I have to discipline. But it doesn't make them less or more my children. They are still my children. Children, the same way there are days that God must discipline us. There are days that when we don't serve as, as faithfully as we should, but it does not change our position if our position is stayed secure in Christ. Not in anyone else, not in our works. And we are kept, notice there, um, as it says, by Jesus Christ as well. In the same book there, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11, it says, And such were some of you, speaking of, uh, people that were sinful, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Notice all of this is done by the Spirit. You don't do it. I don't do it. It says the Spirit washes us. That means when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, he takes all these sinful imperfections off of us and spiritually cleanses every ounce of it away. Some people use the phrase, well, I need to get my sin under the blood. The blood does not cloak our sin. The blood washes away our sin. And the Bible says this never to be brought back against us again. It's washed as far as the east is from the west. Notice the east and the west, it just keeps going, keeps getting further away. Let me tell you something. When you place your faith in Christ and you were sanctified, the Spirit fully cleansed you. And if it fully cleansed you, that means it cannot be brought back upon you. It says the Spirit also sanctifies us, it positions us, and it justifies us. Folks, you cannot get one without the other two. You get all three as a package deal. The moment you are cleansed, you're placed in Christ, and you are appeared in God's eyes just as if you never sinned. Perfectly blameless, holy, just as God is. Because when Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, and all this, you know, every one of these verses, verses mentions the Lord Jesus. As when Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, Jesus didn't just go there to pardon our sins. He went there to take the penalty of our sins. You see, if we just got a pardon, then our crime never got paid for. It was just overlooked. But our God, because he's a just God, he doesn't just pardon our sins. He sent Jesus to pay for our sins. That's why when he sees us, he sees Jesus. When he sees Jesus, he saw us. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13 says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. He chose you. You did not choose God. God chose you. How did God choose you? Through the sanctification process. He set you aside for salvation, set you aside for ministry, set you aside for a calling on your life. It is not uh, just this random, you wake up and say, you know what, I think I'm going to sing for Jesus. Right? You wake up and say, you know what, I think I'm going to become a missionary. Right? You wake up and say, I think I'm going to become a pastor. No, God places those things on your heart. Just as he did the prophet Jeremiah when he said he had chosen him before he was knit together in his mother's womb. Before he was ever even thought of, God had a plan for the ministry of him. He has a plan for the ministry of you because you are special in God's eyes. Hebrews 2, 10 through 11 says, For it became in him for whom all are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering for both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren so who does the sanctifying is it us no it's jesus that does the sanctifying he is responsible for all this folks we have gotten to a day and time where people have made it a all about me salvation and when we look at what god says over and over and over again tonight all the glory continually points back to God. And that's what it's designed to be. When we come here to worship Him, we don't sing songs about us. 
We don't sing songs about what we do, at least we shouldn't. We sing songs about what God has done, what Jesus has done. And that is the true state of worship. The moment you start making anything about your salvation, about you, you are making yourself the idol of worship. And guess what? A lot of people like to worship themselves. We, uh, people say all the time, we've got a problem today in the world that people don't love themselves enough. But the Bible tells us people love themselves too much. It's the complete opposite. That's why Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Because he knew we loved ourselves more than anything. They may be things you don't like about us, but at the end of the day, we love me. We all do. And because of that, he always says, love this as you love yourself. In other words, above all things. Folks, we need to make it more about God. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, once we are sanctified, once we are in Christ, it isn't a situation where we jump in and out of Christ. There are people that I know and you know that are in and out of church, flip-flopping back and forth. They're saved today. They think they're unsaved tomorrow and unsaved the next day. They're here and they're there. They're in between. But the Bible says once and for all the sacrifice was made. So the question is not are they in, are they out, and in and out, and in and out. The question is were they ever in? And if they were in, they're still in. Because you can't bring Jesus up and crucify him afresh. He died as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind. And when you have accessed that salvation gift, it is yours. Your name is recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And you are kept until the day of our Lord. There's no, no in and out here and there. God doesn't say, well, I'm going to save you, but then you must do X, Y, and Z to keep it. There is nowhere in the Bible that I have ever found that. And if you find it and you can bring it up to me, I'm more than glad to read it. But I've not found anyone yet who can show it to me. And they'll ask the question. They'll say, well, you know, I, yeah, you're saved by grace. But da 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 so adding stuff on. And I say, then what must you do to make God turn on you? Because Roman 8 is very clear to me. He says, nothing is going to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Why? Because his love is not founded in Justin. His love is founded in Christ Jesus. Because he, the reason he pours his love out on me is because he sees Jesus when he looks at me. Now, if he loves, obviously he loves his child and I'm in Jesus, he's not going to quit loving me. He's not going to leave me. He's not going to forsake me because the word promises me that he will not. One sacrifice for man forever. Period. Our God is not an Indian giver. Hebrews 13, 12 says, Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with what? With his own blood suffered without the gate. The, and the ancients said that the Christian faith was the uh, most brutal Religion known to man because it kept mentioning the blood. But without the blood, there is no salvation. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And it's by the blood of Jesus Christ, not by the goat, blood of goats and calves, that we are saved and positioned in Him. And I thank God tonight that I'm in Him and there is no taking me out of Him. Not only are we positionally sanctified, we are progressively sanctified. And that, we're going to look at Romans chapter 6. If you want to flip, we're going to be there for quite a while. I'm done with my jumping around tonight. That was my workout. We're going to stick in Romans for just a little while. Romans 6, starting in verse 1. And this topic of progressive sanctification goes right along with our Sunday school lesson this morning. And I love when this happens because... I, I've got news for you. In the perfect world, I would look at every single Sunday school lesson coming and base sermons around that, but I do not. Um, I, I get my lessons as they come. I start the week, like I'll start tomorrow morning studying for next Sunday's lesson. I do sometimes sneak peek ahead and see where we're going to make sure I'm not preaching the same text. However, when it comes together perfectly and they sort of relate to each other, that's all God. That ain't nothing to do with me. And it seems like what has happened tonight, and I thank him for that, but in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, we see the topic of progressive sanctification. What this, this is the process that happens after you are in Christ. So a lot of times, unfortunately, people think, well, they come forward, they, they accept Jesus, they get in Christ, and then God's done. 
But that ain't what God does. God is never done. God starts working us and it continues forever. My little nieces used to sing that song, He's Still Working on Me, because He is still working on all of us if we are saved and born again. This is the process the Holy Spirit works in our bodies after we are saved. And we look at Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1. And the Bible says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? They're asking a simple question here. You see, a lot of people don't like the idea that once you're saved by grace and you're kept by grace, they say, why don't I just do whatever I want? Because for the Christian, that idea is appalling. It's disgusting to think that a person can be saved by the grace of God and then just go out and sin willfully. It's not to say we don't slip up. It's not to say Christians don't make mistakes. Christians get themselves in messes sometimes. But what it does say is the idea of unrepentant, blatant, willful sin should never come to the mind of a Christian. They should have a desire to live the best they can to please God. Now, there are times the uh, pastor Max Licato wrote a book called Grace. And inside that book, he talks about how when he was a young minister, he was talked into social drinking. So he didn't drunk, get drunk, he just was a social drinker. And he would go out of town to buy his wine because he didn't want to buy it in town, afraid someone would see him. And one day he was in this other town buying his wine, and he came out and he got in his car and he noticed some of his church members walking by the car. And he ducks down in the seat, clenches his bottle of wine, praying that, to God that those people don't see him with this bottle of wine. And while he is laying there, kneeled down in the car, God reveals to him, if this is really okay, why are you hiding? Now, obviously he was practicing a sin for, for a little bit at least before he came to realize that. Does that mean he wasn't a Christian? No. But what that means is God was disciplining him and getting his attention so he would repent of that sin. That's how God works in all of our lives. You know, as a child, a child sometimes will misbehave for a little bit before you'll finally discipline that bad behavior out of them. It's kind of like biting your nails. Listen, the hardest thing for some people to do is quit biting their nails. And they'll bite the nails and bite the nails. You've got to work and, and work with them. And it's like a child sucking its thumb. You do all kinds of things. Put stuff in their thumb so it tastes bad or nails keep them from sucking their thumb. God works on us in the same way. We have sin in our life and God convicts us of our sin and draws us out of our sin and disciplines the sin out of us. Doesn't mean we don't ever slip back and make mistakes again. But it means we are a work in progress. He goes on in verse 3 and says, Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. In other words, we're a new creature. When we become saved, old things are passed away, all things become new. We should have a change of perspective. We should have a new life, abundant life. The things that pleases God should please us, and the things that make God sick should also make us sick. We should be more like him every single day. Now, as I said, this is a work in progress. As a person is born again, they are born again as a babe in Christ. You see a small child learn to walk, they'll take a few steps and they'll fall. Take a few steps and they'll fall. They're clumsy and they're awkward. But eventually they get up on their own two feet and they're walking on their own. A Christian is much the same way. When they're born again, they may stumble, they may fall, they may get confused, they may need help and support and prayer and all these things that they begin to become more and more and more established in their faith, more strong in the grace of the Lord, the more knowledgeable about what God has them to do. That's why church attendance matters, why it's important. Because while people say, well, I, I don't have to go to church to read my Bible, they don't. But I guarantee most of who don't attend church also don't read their Bible. Some do. Some do. But most don't. And if you ask them, we'll admit that to you. A lot of times I have. Well, that's the first thing we'll say. I don't got to go to church to read my Bible. When's the last time you read your Bible? Well, it's been a little while. Point proven. 
It says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. That's us. If we are dead to ourselves and alive in Christ, we are dead from the shackles that sin has upon us. It's not to say the flesh don't desire sin. We're in the flesh, and the flesh will always desire that which is good. I got news for you. I, I have the hardest time going into a candy store without coming out of the old bar fudge. I desire it. I crave it. If I go into a restaurant and there's all this bread on my table, it tastes good. I want to eat it. I want to enjoy it. Make it feel good. Uh, when we look at sin, sin feels good. That's why it's tempting to us. So our flesh craves sin, but Jesus says he provided a way of escape from the sin. That we can be unshackled and set free from the sin burden that is within us. He says, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that, what, that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, all liveth unto God. That means as a Christian, you have a purpose of living to God, serving God, following God. If a Christian, Christian, I'll use air quotes, because people a lot of times say they're Christians. If a person says they are a Christian, but they have no desire, no plan, no want to, to serve God in any form or fashion, and I'm not just talking in church attendance, I'm talking about period, then they have a problem and they may not be in God. Folks, people need to be very careful. Um, read a, a book once about and it was, a guy as a pastor, he's talking about witnessing. And he talked about this gentleman he played basketball with. And he played basketball with this guy and this guy was just, he had no fruit. He cussed, he had all kinds of awful attitude, he, he was hateful, he was greedy, he was self-centered. He had zero Christian attributes. He'd been in and out of jail, you name it. And, the, and this pastor had the idea, at the reason he was playing basketball with this guy was to witness to him. It was a community basketball court. He said, I'm going to play basketball and I'm going to witness and I'm going to win him to Jesus. And he had done, been doing this for a while and he kind of tried to drive the point home. And all of a sudden the guy looked at him and says, you ain't got to tell me about Jesus. He says, what do you mean? He says, I got saved when I was four. I'm good. You've got nothing to worry about. He said, what? I, you're in and out of jail because of drugs and you cuss and you you're, do all these things. He said, I don't matter. He said, it's got nothing to do with any of it. I prayed a prayer. I'm good. But the problem the guy had is he had no idea what the gospel was. As he talked to him and tried to, live, tried to kind of get into what the gospel meant, what it meant to be saved, what it meant to be sinner, what it meant to need Jesus. All he could talk about was the prayer he recited as a small child. And the guy had the hardest time trying to get across. I don't know if it ever got across to him. It doesn't bring it out in the book where they actually show him, this is why you need Christ. Folks, people have to have an understanding of the gospel. It cannot just be what I did. I have, I have kids come to school all the time. The first thing they'll say, guess what, Mr. Baker, I got saved. I mean, they'll say, I got baptized. That's it, I got baptized. And I'll say, well, that's great. Why did you get baptized? And they start stumbling. Many don't know. Besides, it was good. Mamaw's happy. Everybody was happy. I want to get baptized. Sometimes the timing is not right. Sometimes there need to be gospel conversations had, folks, because these people are not dying to themselves and living in Christ. Verse 13 says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What does that mean? If it doesn't have dominion, it means it doesn't have control of us. That means if a Christian gives in to sin, they are choosing to give in to sin. We make choices. We make bad choices sometimes as Christians. Sometimes we see things we say and do, and we have to repent of those things. The Bible says we should die to ourselves daily. Every day I can examine myself before bed, and I can find things that Justin done that Justin wishes he didn't do. Justin, I can find things I didn't do that I wish I had done. 
Times I wish I'd pray more. Times which I'd witness more. Times which I, I, I had a gospel opportunity that I missed because I got busy or something. All kinds of things. There are sin that I've got to give over to God. But you know what? I make the choice in those situations. God doesn't tempt me to sin. The devil tempts me to sin. And I must choose every single day who I will serve with my life. And the Bible says we should present our bodies a living sacrifice every single day, living unto God. It says, What then? Shall we sin because we're under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants, ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. It does not mean that as obedience is what saves it, but it means we show our salvation through our obedience. When I have a brother or sister that may not be a part of the church, maybe it's one I encounter, and they tell me that they're a Christian, the first thing that turns my turns me real cold on them is when I see them being disobedient. I see them participating in crude jokes they shouldn't be participating. See them talking about people and gossiping. See them being hateful and angry with folks. See them being short-tempered with folks. The Bible says that one of, the, one of our fruits of the Spirit is self-control. If they can't control themselves in an everyday setting... Are they legit? Are they the real deal? You may say, well, God doesn't need our works. He gives us His grace. He does. But your neighbor needs your works. Your neighbor needs your testimony, your witness. It matters how you live in front of these people. Verse 17 says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after this manner of men, because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, to iniquity, unto, into iniquity, and even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness, unto holiness. If we see this, this is a complete 180. Complete 180. That means all these people living in unrepentant sin and saying, well, I can't help it. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You're right. We are all sinners saved by grace. We are all a bunch of jacked up sinners. But at the same time, we are saved and born again. We are set on a highway of holiness through and by the grace of God. We have been delivered from that life, delivered from that way of thinking. That's really what the word repent means. The word repent does not mean never to sin again. It means a change of mind, which means I don't want anything to do with the old way and the old path. I want to serve Jesus and walk in the new path, not because it's going to save me, but because I love him and he already saved me. And through that, I have a desire to serve him and not serve the world. Folks, too many people are the kind of Christian that makes God sick. Look at the book of Revelation. It tells you what that is. A lukewarm believer. They ain't hot. They ain't cold. They're just lukewarm. They're just there. They'll say there's, it, it is a lot easier to witness to an outright atheist than it is a lukewarm believer. Because there's a lot of lukewarm believers who just need the gospel given to them. Because sometimes they, just ain't, they don't know if the gospel even is. But they don't want to hear it. Because they think they know it. They think they know more than you do. They ain't been in the church in 30 years. They think they know more. The atheists will admit they don't know anything. If they're honest. Because atheism in itself is a religion. It's a worship of yourself. You think you're all you need. You're worshiping you. But if you show them the grace of God, occasionally you'll get their attention. Same thing with witnessing to a Mormon. If you ever encounter Mormons, and I've had a lot of Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses as well, come to me and bring me literature in the last several years. Uh, when Mandy first had say, there was a lady come to our apartment in Chattonville once a week, every week, and we sit on my porch. I would let her in my house. we sit on my porch and she would try to win me over and I would talk to her. And occasionally she calls me at the house now. And she'll call me up, get me on the phone. Um, but here's the thing about it. all these different religions or cults are literally work-based religions. If you give in the scripture and talk about how Jesus loves you, even though you're a sinner and wants to save you, and that's how you get into heaven, people will start to listen. That's why these groups do all this um, work, because they're constantly trying to find a way to please God. Just enough to when they die, they can get in. It doesn't work that way. We can't do enough to please God. 
God, we please God by our faith in His grace and that He continually molds us to be more like Him. Nor are we positionally sanctified and placed in Christ. God progressively sanctifies us and grows us in His grace, in His knowledge, in His holiness that we only can receive by the Holy Spirit. God is not a motivational speaker. He is not here to tell you to make yourself better. God says, I'm going to make you better. Because we are created by Him unto good works, not unto us. But my third and final point, while we are positionally sanctified and progressively sanctified, until we leave this world, we're never perfectly sanctified physically. Spiritually, the moment we're saved, we are positionally perfect. We are in Jesus. You can't get no better than that spiritually. But even at that moment, the flesh still craves the things of the flesh. We are still in the flesh. There is a constant conflict between our inward man and our outward man. And in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh, that's our outward man, lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murder, drunkenness, reveling, and such like of, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But we see the other side, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The outward man and the inward man. If you're here tonight and you're saved and born again, those are battling right now. The inward man and the outward man. My outward man, a lot of times says when I get up on Sunday morning, you're tired, you don't feel good, your back hurts, you got a headache. I, my, the outward man just wants to stay in bed. The inner man says, you love the Lord, he loves you, you want to get up and go to church and serve him and praise him and enjoy a great time in God's house. Listen, pastors have those same conflicts. A lot of times in the evening when I read God's Word or at lunch, when I read God's Word at work, the outward man wants to eat a big old bite, watch some TV, catch a Western, but the inner man says, crack open God's Word. You've got 15, 20 minutes. You can get into some scripture that's going to strengthen you. That constant battle is going to take place until the day we are glorified in His presence. You are never going to escape that. But I have learned in my Christian walk, that which I feed is the one that wins out in the end. If I don't ever open God's word, if I don't ever pray, if I don't take time to do the things that God has asked me to do, the outward man is going to give in. You look at a lot of these celebrity Christians, and it happened a lot in the 80s, and you're seeing it happen a lot again. A lot of celebrity Christians find themselves in really bad, sinful situations. It may not be because of a salvation problem. It may be because of which did they feed more problem. A lot of times if people get busy, they become famous, they're out signing autographs, writing books, do all these things, everything except what God asks them to do. They get busy and weary and well-doing. And what happens? They start to find themselves craving fleshly things more than spiritual things. Folks, when you turn on the radio, turn on spiritual things. Again, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily horrible to listen to other kinds of music. I do sometimes. But I try to listen to Christian music more. You read a book? I read history books. I read mystery novels. But I try to read more of spiritual things, godly things, God's Word. If you have a conversation, try to focus it on God's Word. And that inner man becomes stronger, begins to come out, and begins to be what people see. We'll close out in 1 John tonight, chapter 3, as we look at the sobering reality of all of this. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9 says, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin, speaking of Jesus. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. 
He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning for his purpose that the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest. And the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness, is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Now those are very, very, very sobering words. And as it talks and uses that word committeth sin there, one may think that that is a, a sinless perfectionism. That's not what it's, it's really saying. If you translate that word into more modern English, that word committeth sin is practices sin. One, in other words, one who lives an ungodly life. I had a, a wise pastor tell me one time, he said, Preacher, it's like this. If it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it's probably a duck. If it lives after the world, if it walks after the world and talks after the world, it's probably of the world. If it walks after God, talks after God, loves God, it's probably of God. Folks, if we are truly saved and truly born again, we should be continually sanctified. First, positionally into Christ, and then progressively as we grow in Him. We're on close.